Hi there, and uh, thank you very much. I've got the ball. <laughs> so um, hopefully everybody can see and hear me, or if not, somebody's going to jump up on the chat and I'll see that. And um, so thank you very much um, for inviting me to talk today. Um, I don't do heritage, uh, and I'm not a researcher, so I'm fairly terrified, frankly, about talking to you all. But um, listening into the, the morning so far, it does feel like there's, um, there's work that I've done that touches and crosses over with you. So. Um, I prepared a little, it's more of a story than a presentation. Um, so I guess I'll start a little bit with um, who I am. Um, so my work um, started in theatre um, in production, and then I moved into working in green buildings and holistic sustainability. And so looking particularly at the master plan level of how we integrate sustainability in the broad sense into larger new developments. Um, I got very into green retrofit. Um, and then I moved from that into the next moment in my career, which has really been around social enterprise and asset based community development. So I've probably spent the last five or six years of my life working with communities who own buildings and use them and putting into practice everything that I learned um, when I was developing frameworks for how to design and retrofit buildings better. Um, and so really my, my career's question has been about how climate change and the wealth gap can be addressed. And I really feel quite strongly that those two things have got common causes and also common solutions. Um, and what weaves those together, I think, um, to pick up a little bit on something that Calliope said is whenever you start to do a systems analysis, it appears quite quickly that it's the people who are missing um, from consideration and it's that um, the environment is often unconsidered as well. Um, so I've kind of taken taken that approach to to my work in terms of I got as far as I could in green building before I realised that actually you need to be working with the people who are operating, running, and using the buildings, um, and so that's been the throughput for me. Um, so the story um, that I wanted to tell you about was about my definition of sustainability and where that came from, um, because it starts with me trying to do research on sustainability. Um, and the impact of it is that I stop doing research and start getting on with doing certain things. Um, and so I went to Japan on um, a government scholarship to be in the environmental architecture department of Kyoto University, which was just an absolutely fantastic moment. It was around 2006, seven, And I went there fresh out of my master's course um, with a really specific piece of research I wanted to carry on in the Japanese context. So I wanted to look at school buildings as tools for education and also as flagships for um, re retrofit. Um, but as so happens, I ended up in a department where they, they just weren't interested in a foreign girl trying to sort of do what she wanted to do. Um, and they had and some absolutely incredible projects that were happening. And the first one of those was the J-Pod, which was looking at taking um, forest thinnings, so trees that were um, weak out of the forest and using those weak trees to create strong buildings and they were um, small modular timber units that could actually be inserted into heritage buildings to give um, a room that would be a safe room in the event of a natural disaster so uh, a landslide or um, an earthquake which would be the main Japanese context and I was watching this project and just thinking isn't this fantastic this refocusing on locally sourced timber and perhaps what I could be doing is looking at the carbon emissions, you know, so the impact of this on, firstly, we're not taking down the heritage buildings so we can preserve the embodied carbon in them. And then secondly, we're making use of local timber and not internationally sourced timber. And um, so I wanted to, I made a proposal to my department, I changed my research to look at that. And I was told, absolutely no, will you do any, you must not do any research that is around carbon um, and sustainability in, this, in, in our department. I said, well, this is, this is quite strange because um, for me, carbon and, and climate change are quite interrelated. And as a department for the environmental sustainability, I'd expect that we were looking at that and talking about those things. Um, and back in those days, I was quite an activist. Uh, I think anyone who knows me would know I still am. And so I say, is there a vested interest here or issues with import taxes or something that you're wanting me not to challenge? And they said, oh, no, no, no. That's just not part of our definition of sustainability. That's a Western concept of sustainability that you're bringing with you. Um, and quote unquote, um, because in your country you don't have natural disasters, you've had to invent 
climate change for something to worry about. Um, and I was quite quite taken aback at that. It was really not what I was expecting from you know the kind of like week three of the research project when I had a, a year to be funded. Um, and so I kind of took it with a pinch of salt, talked to other people in the department and, and just really got involved with what it was that they were doing on the timber project and kind of hiding my background interest in carbon. Um, and the, the further that I got into it, um, the more I realized just how much incredible work was going on, all of which had these carbon impacts, but they weren't seen as the important bits of sustainability. So there were heritage aspects of the work and there were community aspects of the work where um, uh, cooperatives had been set up by, uh, with foresters and those um, old um, forestry cooperatives were being um, having life rebreathed into them because um, as Japan ages um, and as the context of forestry has changed, there aren't young people coming into them. So what they were actually doing is matchmaking excited young people from the university to these um, villages. And so we as students were going out and doing forestry, um, which led to me having a, a nickname of Beckham because they felt that I will look like David Beckham. So that dates the period of time that I was involved a little bit. Um, but we we spent a, a good couple of weeks out in the forest um, with the traditional foresters um, selling timber in traditional ways that were to be used to create these modern inserts into traditional heritage buildings. So there was a lot of conversation at that point. Um, and the, the bit that people were most passionate about was passing on food culture. And I was like, this is just absolutely crazy. I'm still trying to, to do the carbon element of this sustainability project, but nobody really wants to talk about it. Um, and everybody wants to talk about food. And so there was this very strange and, and uh, experience where we, all the people of the village assembled and we were given um, a feast. And the fi fi <laughs> fish that we were given was so heavily salted, it was almost inedible. And we all sat there, the, the young students from the university going, oh my God, this is disgusting. We don't know what to do. And I was looking around at the Japanese colleagues going, oh, is this because I'm, I'm an outsider? That I'm struggling with a fish and I was watching my young Japanese colleagues and they were also struggling um, and then uh, as often happens in Japan when they make you eat something that's fairly uncomfortable they explain the reason um, and the reason was and um, this is our traditional fish from this particular village and um, you will understand tomorrow why this is the most delicious thing ever and we all sat there very nervous we slept overnight in um, the foresters like a kind of like a village hall I woke up the next day and we went out for the first day to work with the foresters and um, Japan is a very humid place. We sweated absolute buckets and that evening they prepared us the same fish dish and it was genuinely the most, one of the most de delicious things that I've ever eaten. Um, and it was really just a moment of going, oh my gosh, everything, every, literally everything is about context. This salty fish on a day where you've been sweating and working as a forester is, is no longer inappropriate. And so I think around about that moment, I began to open my mind and just drop my concept of sustainability. Like it didn't mean that climate change went away or um, I suddenly stopped caring about carbon emissions. I just allowed my version and my, my framework for understanding sustainability to drop and began to receive and pick up alternatives. So throughout that rest of that project, I started being more interested in, in following the Japanese peers definitions of sustainability um, and interestingly enough at the moment I stopped trying to push my agenda and people started picking up on it and you know I'm still in an active conversation with some of the professors there about carbon which they're now very interested in as part of, of the research that things have moved on um, but to go through to that moment we then um, as part of our team who had been working in the research department on timber, we were invited um, from Japan to go to Vietnam to do a community house. And there was a really interesting moment there where um, everybody assumed that they should build a concrete building because then it would be really modern. Um, and I made a challenge, like, why are we building a concrete building in, in this small village in Vietnam? Why aren't we using bamboo? And again, by that point, I'd learned not to say this is I'm making this point about carbon. So I said, oh, I just really interested from a, um, a point, you know, point of view of um, its durability for natural disaster. So that question um, then raised conversations, and it turned out that the 
elders in the village had assumed that their young people were not interested in traditional building techniques. Um, and all the young people had assumed that they, they ought to learn the very best of thinking from the Japanese and that that would be concrete. And so all three of these core stakeholders had been making, making some strong assumptions. Um, and just through that outside challenge, they ended up realizing that everybody did want to do a bamboo project and that the village itself was composed of several dif displaced um, groups who'd never worked together, who all had very different Japanese, um, what you would call um, weaving techniques for the bamboo, um, as did the Japanese people. So there was this wonderful moment of everybody sharing culture. And again, um, most of the most of the successful moments of that project happened in a hot spring and around food. And so I could see my version of sustainability growing. And so what happened for me at that point was that I, I gave up my research and I returned to the UK to focus on, on sort of this kind of lifelong impact of that period of attempting to do research on um, sustainability in Japan kind of led to my me, me recognizing how important culture and heritage are when you wrap them into concepts of managing sustainability because um, to Calliope's point you know, quite often the, the people are missing in what we think about things. Um, and to Alison's point, um, well-being is really the fruit of sustainability. And so if we're just talking about the pip all of the time, we're not really selling things in a very good way. So um, I was quite minded as Beth was speaking in her um, talk. I, don't, I know nothing about Cape Town, actually, but the concept of trying to sell people really hard on the cultural value of a site and how difficult that is to prove, that really resonated with me in my recent practice. Um, I've probably spent the last five years in London fighting to maintain a level of affordable space for our cultural sector and our cultural economy. Um, and I think it's been, it's been one of the most difficult things to prove the impact that culture um, has. And we've gone as far as being able to prove that one in six jobs in London is in culture and the relationship of um, spaces for um, people coming out of um, training and into production um, and the relationship between that and the culture that is consumed in the West End or the culture that's consumed in the museums is, is very clearly proven and yet, yet we really struggle to um, maintain and, and retain those spaces. Um, and again, that's, I guess, a bit about how, how we all can make evidence-based policy. Um, and there's this kind of, sometimes we just, we have to have this evidence in order to prove things that are just very obvious with us as humans. And so I think um, in, in kind of conclusion, um, when we're thinking about climate change and the wealth gap, or when we're thinking about sustainability or well-being, it really is being able to look at things in the round. And that, that for me is one of the most critical things. And I think that's why because of everything being so interconnected, when you look at Calliope's like fantastic mapping, these things are so connected and so complex that it becomes very difficult to boil that down to give policymakers advice. They just want to know two or three things that you can do. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank yes. you so much, Sarah.